All right, so I'm going to talk about the idea of a substring in this video, as well as some methods that actually make use of this idea. But the idea of a substring is also going to be super important for uh, other concepts going forward in this chapter. So I wanted to get this, you know, talked about ahead of time. I'm continuing to go rogue from the textbook. We're now jumping to 7.4 and 7.5 from the focus on the concepts material and a little bit of a spoiler here we're actually covering them in the wrong order anyway so it it's going to be a little bit out of order from the textbook just you know heads up for that with regards to if you are reading it for yourself but i believe that this uh method of presenting the information is going to be really helpful in the long run i think it will give everyone a really good understanding of these concepts and really help make the other concepts in the chapter a lot easier to understand. So a substring is a string completely contained within another string. Um, that's sort of the fast way of saying it. The more accurate way of saying it is a string whose characters are completely contained in the correct order within another string. So for example, um, ta space ma with an uppercase m is a substring of santa maria you can see the ta space ma between sort of in this middle area of santa maria right there uh however ma space ta would not be a substring of santa maria all the characters are there in fact the ma is there and the ta is there and even the space is there but they're not in the right order, which means that it's not actually a substring. The order, as well as the individual characters, is really important here. Uh, the string containing just the letter A is a substring of blah, because blah has just the letter A in it. Now, what's really interesting is that the empty string is actually considered a substring of any other string. It doesn't matter what, the empty string is always a substring of it because you could just say that the empty string is contained between any two characters of the string and also before the first character and also before the last character because the empty string isn't any characters at all. You can think of it as like the division between the two characters even, if, if it helps to think of it like that. Uh, and then a string will always be a substring of itself. So for example, visual basic is a substring of visual basic. As long as all the capitalization is correct, because remember, we talked about this with uh, two upper and two lower. Uh, capital V, for example, is not the same as lowercase v. So if visual basic on the left was all lowercase and visual basic on the right was properly capitalized, then the all lowercase version would not be a substring of the upper of the uh, properly capitalized version because it has different characters. The difference being the uppercase lowercase situation. Because the left string has the same characters as the right string in the exact same order, then it is a substring. The right string technically can completely contains the left string because the left the right string is the left string they both contain the same characters i hope that makes sense it's uh a weird way to kind of define this edge case if you catch my drift another important example right here is that the string grablag is not a substring of blah because the string containing blah needs, uh, does not contain every single character from grablach. Even though grablach contains blah inside of it, and the right side is the string blah, grablach, the larger string, is not a substring of the smaller string blah. See, the the right side of this sort of substring relationship here needs to contain everything in the left side. 
It works if they're completely equal, as we see with Visual Basic right here. It works if the right side contains the left side and other things, as we see with Santa Maria containing all of Ta Ma. If that's the case, then the left is a substring of the right. Ta Ma is a substring of Santa Maria. Ah is a substring of blah. The empty string is a substring of any string because any string contains the empty string sort of in between all the characters or however you want to think about it. And Visual Basic contains every th character in Visual Basic in order. But Grablach is not a substring of blah, even though Grablach contains everything in blah. In fact, blah is a substring of Grablach but it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. It's a one-way relationship sometimes. So suppose you have a string called string name and you're looking to see if string sub is a substring of string name. Well, what you would do is you would invoke string name dot contains the contains method of string name, and then you pass in string sub and it returns true if string sub is a substring of string name, and false if string sub is not a substring of string name. For example, if I want to see if the string ta space ma, where the m is capitalized, uh, is a substring of Santa Maria, I can take the string containing Santa Maria, invoke the contains method of it, and then pass in the string containing ta ma, and it will evaluate to true because ta space ma is a substring of Santa Maria. However, if I pass in ta ma but with a lowercase m instead of an uppercase m, uh, it will be false specifically because of that lowercase m not actually being contained in the string Santa Maria. Uh, similar, similarly, uh, ta ma with no space and a lowercase m is not a substring. So passing that into dot contains would evaluate to false. And then passing in ma ta with an uppercase m, and of course, you know, it has all of the correct characters in it, it's just in the wrong order. Uh, that will also be false if I pass that into the dot contains method because it's still not a substring, it has to be in the right order. Out of all of these, only ta space ma with an uppercase m is a true substring. Another interesting one is um, if I check the string containing Santa and I check the dot contains method of that and pass in Santa Maria, that's also going to be false because the string containing Santa does not contain Santa Maria. It's only Santa. It doesn't have that space in Maria or anything like that. So remember that a substring uh, has to be completely contained within the string that you're checking for it to actually be a substring and for dot contains to be true. And then of course if you pass in the empty string uh, into the contains method it will be true and if you pass in the string itself into the contains method of that string or even a different string that just has the exact same characters in the exact same order uh, that would be true. So blah does contain itself. So therefore the string containing blah dot contains the string containing blah is true. So when we invoke a uh, string name dot contains and we pass in another string, the dot contains method of string name just returns true if the string that we passed in is a substring of string name and false otherwise. The next one I want to talk about is index of, which actually works a lot like contains once you sort of unravel what's going on in there. Um, what it does is when you invoke some strings index of method uh, and you pass in some string that you think may or may not be a substring of it, uh, it's going to actually search for that string inside of the uh, actual you know, string name instead of the string that invoked index of. So it's still actually checking 
to see if uh, the string you pass in is a substring because it's searching through the string looking for the string you pass in. Contains actually does exactly the same thing. Uh, however, it works, you know, what it gives back is going to be a little bit different. Um, really quick though, let me talk about int start because you can optionally add int start into it. Um, int start, integer start, is essentially the starting integer of the search for this possible substring. For whatever reason, if you want to make sure that you're not searching before like the fifth index, or you're not searching before the first index, if you have a special character at index zero or something like that, you can specify int start and index of will start searching at the index specified by int start. So int start is the starting index of your search in the string for string sub. However, if you don't specify it, it starts searching at index zero. So from the very beginning all the way to the very end. All right, so the return values are sort of what makes um, index of feel a little bit like contains. Essentially, uh, if index of didn't find string sub in string name, it returns negative one. Otherwise, it returns a positive, or sorry, a non negative integer. Um, now, that doesn't mean that string sub isn't in string name if negative one is returned. Uh, it may be that it's not found after the starting index that you specified. If you specified it starts at index five, but it's not found after index five, but it is found before index five. Well, if you specified index five, index will only start searching at index five and after, which means that it will never find string sub, even though string sub is a substring of string name, it just appears before where it starts looking. So if it's not found, then it returns negative one. If it is found, if it is found either after zero or after um, int the starting index that's specified, uh, inclusive of course, um, it returns the index of the start of the first instance of string sub. If there are multiple instances, it returns the start of the first index, the uh, index of the start of the first instance, my apologies, um, if it's found. So that number will actually be between zero and the length of the big string minus the length of the small string. Um, just because there's only, so you, you have to account for the amount of room it takes for the small string to actually have all of its characters in the big, str big string. So if you're looking for a um, length one substring and a length 10 string, uh, it will be between zero and nine. If you're looking for length two and a length 10 string, it'll be between zero and eight and so on and so forth. But the returns are either negative one, you know, if it's not found at all or some non-negative number. Either it's negative and you didn't find it, or it's non-negative and you did find it. And yeah, it's a good condition for if statements, right? If the uh, if it returns something less than zero, then you didn't find it. If it returns something greater than or equal to zero, you did find it. So back to our um, array. This time I actually capitalized the S and M in Santa Maria here. But if I am looking for the index of the string Maria inside of string city, uh, that index is going to be six because Maria starts at the index six. Uh, and note, of course, we wouldn't be able to find Maria at index seven, eight, nine, or 10 because it's a five length string. So it couldn't even fit in seven, eight, nine, or 10. So it would have to stop searching at after uh, index six. But, um, if I was looking for this uh, string containing Maria after, you know, starting my search at index four, it would still find Maria at index six and return six. However, if I started my search at seven, 
There's no way you can even fit Maria in there, but if it did naively search the rest of the string to see if Maria was in the last four indices, it wouldn't find it at all, and it would return negative one to show that it didn't find it, even though Maria is completely contained in this string. It's just not contained at seven, index seven or later. Now the index of Maria but lowercase is going to be negative one because uh, the string containing Maria all lowercase is not found in string city since Maria is uppercase here. So there's no uh, lowercase Maria. This string does not exactly appear in Santa Maria, which is a good um, reason why you should use methods like to upper and to lower when you're working off of your index of uh, calls. However, if I looked at string city, actually, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. If I look at string city and then I uh, take the all lowercase version of it, not modifying string city, remember, I'm just looking at the string that is equivalent to string city, but all lowercase. So now it's all, now it's Santa Maria, all lowercase. And then I try to find uh, the index of the string containing Maria, all lowercase, then that would show up as six because this M right here that is uppercase at index six would be lowercase in the to lower version of it. I can also do things like look for the index of the string just containing a space and index of returns five, which is actually really helpful because we'll actually show off how we can use this to split off words from each other in a string. So then we could get the string just containing Santa and the string just containing Maria. So the substring method is another method uh, that we can use to work with substrings in strings, but this time it actually gives you substrings. So you can actually create substrings from strings. What you do is you pass in the starting index, the index of where you want the substring to start, and then you can optionally pass in the length of the substring. And it will give you a substring starting at the starting index you uh, passed in. Um, if you don't specify the length, it just gives you from the starting index all the way to the end. So it's actually really good if you want to get rid of um, a certain amount of text from the beginning of your string. However, if you do specify a uh, length of your substring, then it will give you a substring starting at that starting index with sub length number of characters. So if you pass in uh, four and five, it will give you the substring starting at index four, length five, which means that you'll have the characters at indices four, five, six, seven, and eight. So here's some example substrings. The substring starting at index three of length five is the string ta space ma. Um, the substring starting at index six and not uh, specifying a length, which means that it goes all the way to the end, is going to be Maria. Substring uh, starting at index four with length zero is going to be the empty string. And in fact, it doesn't matter what index you pass in. As long as it has length zero, it will give you an empty string. Uh, the substring starting at um, starting at index two of length one is going to be the string containing the letter N, not the character N, but the string containing the letter N. So you can use substring to give you length one strings as opposed to indexing in and then using two string like we saw in the last video. So it's another way of doing that. Uh, if you want to make a copy of the string um, for whatever reason, then you can just pass in zero as the starting index and no length, and that will give you a new string that is equivalent to the string you started out with. Um, and then if you uh, pass in the uh, 
just some starting value. It doesn't even matter what that starting value is as long as it's greater than zero, but if you pass in some starting value and then you pass in the length of the string, then you get an error. Because, let's say we passed in one and we're trying to get a uh, length 11 substring starting at index one. So one would be a, two would be n, three would be t, four would be a, five would be space, and so on and so on. Uh, the tenth character would be a, but then we still need an eleventh character since we're trying to get the string of length 11, and that doesn't actually exist. So we would get a runtime error off of that. Now, notice if we wanted to split Santa Maria off into its two words, uh, Santa and Maria, well, we could use substring and pass in the starting index of six to get Maria. And we could use substring starting at index zero and pass in the length five to get Santa. But how would we actually get this value if we didn't know the size of Santa and Maria? If we didn't know that they were both length five substrings positioned exactly in that way in the string? Or how would we generalize it so I could also get, um, so I could also split off the words from, you know, other cities that have two names in them. So like Nevada City, Carson City, Fort Bragg, uh, Pismo Beach, all that kind of stuff. They all have different combinations of first word length and last word length, I believe. Um, so we can't hard code values like this if we're trying to make a program that actually splits the words off entirely. So we have to be a little more creative about how we do it. And there's a couple of ways that we can do that and I'll show some of them off in the programs, but Really quick, I wanted to run through one way using substring. Now remember from just a moment ago how we were able to get the index of the space inside of the um, city name. And we knew that the index was five. It was at index five in Santa Maria. Well, maybe if you want, try to pause the video and think about how you could use this information and combine it with some calls to the substring method in order to programmatically get some, uh, you know, get these two words split off from each other into separate substrings while typing in as little uh, integer literals as possible. So take a moment and see if you can figure that out before I show off the answer. Well, naively, what we could do is we could say that if we pass in uh, this call to string city dot index of and pass in the string containing just the space, if we take that whole method call and pass that into substring, then we would get um, Maria, right? We would get the second word since the index of this space right here is showing the division between the two words, which means that if we go after the division, we would be able to get Maria, right? And that is true. We would want to go after the, the division, but the problem is if we just pass in string city dot index of and a couple you know just the the string containing space we would get the string space maria which is fine we could trim it if we wanted to but we don't necessarily have to trim it when we could just add one to our starting index so we take the index of the space which we don't want to start at because we don't want to include the space in our output. Well, we just add one to it and I guess hope that there's only one space between the two words. But assuming our user or our input string or whatever is valid and there's only one space between the two words, 
then, um, you know, we can just add one to the uh, index of the space, which puts us at the index of the first letter of the next word. If we start there and then go to the end, then we have Maria or city or brag or beach or whatever. So that's how we can get the last word using the substring method. Now getting the first word is going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, we have Santa starts at index zero, ends at index four. Uh, it stops before index five. But substring doesn't ask us what the stopping index is. It asks us for the length of the substring. Um, however, the, if it stops before index 5 in this case, then that means th it starts at 0, and the last index the uh, index of the last character is 4. And if you count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's actually 5 numbers that we've counted. So if it stops before, directly before, this string containing a space, and we know that it does, we know that there's no spaces before index 5 specifically because uh, index of gives us the first instance of a space that appears in uh, our string. So if it stops before 5 and it starts at 0, then the length is actually going to be 5. Now if our space appeared for the first time at 8 and we started at 0, well we still would put the length at 8. Because, in that case, if you count up indices 0 through 7, it's the same number of counts as counting indices 1 through 8, for example, so it's like counting on your fingers except you start at 0 instead of 1. You still get 8 total counts even if it adds at 7 in that case, but <clears throat> all that means that we can use the value of index of when we pass in the space as the length of our substring. And what actually happens here when we pass in the length, uh, we use the index of value as the length of our substring, then we get zero as our first argument, five as our second, which is the same thing that we have up here. We get the string containing Santa, but you can do that if you're starting at index zero. And that's really important. If you're starting at index 0, you can do that trick. Now you have to modify it a little bit if you're starting at indices after 0. So for example, if you wanted to start at 1, your length, you know, you have like a special character, like a dollar sign at the very begin beginning, right? Your length wouldn't be equal to the index of the space or the index of whatever delimin delimiting character you're using like a period or something for currency. You want to start at, it, you want to put that as your length. You would put that value minus one as your length because you're traveling one less on your journey over to this special, you know, space character or whatever. Or if you start at two, you would be doing index of minus two and so on and so forth. But it's a really neat trick if you want to use that. Now, when it comes to uh, the substring, method. The substring method can actually throw an argument out of range exception when your um, starting index is less than zero or when the starting index is greater than or equal to the length of the string. So for example, um, if I tried to start at index 11 when I call substring like this, um, if I tried to start at index 11, it would not be valid because there is no index 11. So if I pass in the length of string city into the substring argument, it would try to start at index 11, which doesn't exist, and therefore the whole thing would go bad. 
So you have to start at a valid index no matter what. You also have to pay attention to the length that you pass in if you choose to pass in a length. So the length also has to be non-negative. It can't be less than zero. And you also have to make sure that your starting index plus the length is less than the length of string name. Because if it's greater than or equal to, it will throw this argument out of range exception. So you might want to check that in some of your if statements when you're working with this. Now of note here is that index of can also throw an argument out of range exception if you choose an invalid starting index following these rules up here. Uh, it has to be a valid starting index. All right, so what we have here is a program that just rearranges your name. You have to type in your first name, and then you hit space, and then you type in your last name. In my case, Iris space Kohler. And I click the rearrange the name button, and it outputs Kohler comma space Iris. Not just Kohler space Iris, but Kohler comma space Iris. Isn't that fancy? Um, and if uh, there's no space in there, then it will give me an error. Now, the way this is working is it's going to take in the user input and trim it, which is always good practice, and then it will look for the space inside of the name. If there's no space, then it gives that error like we saw before, but if there is a space, if it's not equal to negative one or if it's greater than zero, or sorry, greater than or equal to zero or greater than negative one, um, what they're going to do is separate the first and last names. And they use the same trick that I showed off before using the index of the space. So they'll separate those first and last names uh, starting at zero with a length uh, equal to the index of the first space contained in the string. Just like we saw with Santa Maria, this would be zero and five. Uh, in my case, it was zero and uh, four. So then a substring starting at zero of length four would just be the string containing iris. And then the last name is the substring starting at the index of the space plus one, which would be uh, for Santa Maria, it would have been five plus one is six. That's where we saw Maria starting before. In my case, it is four plus one is five. And this string last name then contains Kohler. And then it rearranges it. It just concatenates my last name with a comma and a space and then the first name and shows that in the output. So it's very simple. But what we could also do is show a more fun and wacky and complex one. Now this program has its limitations because uh, it only goes through once, right? It's just an if statement. Um, and it's only checking for the first occurrence of a space. In this case, it is between test one and test two right here on my screen. But if I have multiple words right here, it's not going to even touch the rest of them, which means that you get test two space test three comma space test one, which is completely out of order. Um, starting with, you know, the input string being test one space test two space test three, the output string being test two space test three comma test one. So what if we wanted to modify it in order to um, actually handle multiple words like this? Well, let's take a look. All right, so this one is a version that can actually do multiple words. So if I, um, I can start it with my name like we saw before and rearrange it. And we see Kohler comma space iris. If I did test one space test two space test three, uh, unlike before, you'll actually see test three comma space test two comma space test one, like that. So this actually is able to handle multiple words in the same string. And it's even able to handle one word correctly, just like this, test one. Um, nothing bad happens when you have only one word. Although if you wanted to replicate the functionality uh, of the, um, if you wanted to replicate the functionality of 
the previous application where it needed at least two words, it would not be hard to modify what I have here to do, and I can show that off. Uh, let's take a look at the code. All right, so the first thing I do is I get the text from the user and I trim it, so no spaces in there. Um, sorry, no leading or ending spaces in there. And then I check to see if the resulting string is empty, which essentially checks if the user didn't put in anything or if they um, only typed in spaces, like things like that. So if it's empty after I trim it, uh, then just for their convenience, it won't break the program, but I'm going to show them a message box that says, please enter at least one word and get out of there. And we can actually see that right here. If I type in one, two, three, four, five spaces, and then I rearrange the words, it will say, pre, please enter one word. So that's that. Now, once we get past this if statement, because of this exit sub right here, which I've showed off before, if we're down on line 32, line 33, right, we know there's at least one word present. It wasn't an empty string after trimming it. So we're going to search for the space in that word by using index of. So we have this uh, int index right here, and we have a do while int index is not equal to negative one. Now, let's start with a case where there's only one word. I type in something like test, and it just appears down here, nothing has changed. Well, if I type in one word like this, uh, it doesn't matter how many spaces I put before and after, those are gonna get trimmed off, so it's only going to be one word, which means that there's no space in this resulting string. So the index actually is negative one, so I skip over this loop completely, and I just put whatever input I got from the user all the way up here, directly into label rearrange dot text. Now we know that label rearrange dot text is actually going to be completely cleared because I had to actually type something in in order to run the program correctly. And since I typed, the text change event actually clears out the input every time I press a key. And since the uh, input has been cleared, then when I run it, I can guarantee that label rearrange.txt is just the empty string. So I'm appending the string containing test. Uh, you know, I do a concatenation with the empty string. So it's just the string containing test. And then I stick that inside of the label, just like what we saw. So that's the case where there's only one word. Now, when there's two or more words, uh, we have a similar idea, but you know, this time int index is going to be greater than negative one. In fact, it's going to be greater than zero. We know that it's going to be greater than zero because of trim right here, but it's not negative one. So if it's in here, we're guaranteed more than one word and we can separate the first word from the rest. That's actually what I'm doing right here is I'm creating a new string called string prefix and setting that equal to uh, the substring starting at zero and ending at the index of the string. It's the same trick that we saw before. However, then what I'm doing is I'm modifying string words itself, which we haven't seen done before. I'm essentially chopping the first word and the first space off completely by setting string words equal to its own substring starting at the index of the space plus one, starting at the beginning of the next word, assuming that there's only one space separating uh, both of the words, which we have tools to check for that. But, or sorry, we will have tools to check for that later on. And then we can actually use those to detect and make sure that the user input is valid before continuing on with this program. But regardless, I chop off the first word and stick that into string prefix. And then I take the remaining rest of that string, that remaining substring, and I set that equal to string words. So now string words is one word short. Once I do that, 
I will actually do something a little bit crazy. See, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put string prefix into the label. And the first time we go through this loop, the label is empty. So this is the empty string on the right side. This is our first word. Let's say this is Iris from when I typed in my name. However, I also prepend it with a comma and a space. So after this step, we have comma space Iris and then nothing left. Now what I've done is I've actually set a breakpoint at line 52 because I want to show off what label rearrange.txt looks like. So when I put in my name, Iris Kohler, like this, and then I rearrange the words. Um, let's take a look at autos. There we go. Right here, if you can see it in my, um, oh, even better, the text visualizer right here. This is sort of a pretend label so that I can see what's inside of this text field. And you'll see that the value is comma space iris. The reason why that's important is because of the fact that I'm sort of building this string from the very end to the beginning. So I, I start with iris and then I put Kohler to the left of this. So when I'm in the position where I can put Kohler to the left of this, I want to make sure that I already have the punctuation set up because if I right here, um, I'm going to stop and actually modify this. Uh, there we go. And, and that, okay. So if I put the comma space after my string prefix, um, let me, because then, you know, I have every, uh, additional word that I put in is adding the common space after it. Uh, and then you have the rest of the words that I've already seen before after that, right? Well, what happens here is that, you know, I'll start it. Uh, color. And I'll, I'll even type in blah in this case. I'll rearrange the words. Um, and there we go. So now we have iris, comma, and there's an invisible space right there. But I will uh, continue. And the values change. And now if we look at the visualizer, we have color, comma, space, iris, comma, space. And you might be able to see the problem already because this comma space is at the end. And the final value is going to be blah, smash up against my last name, no comma, no space, color, comma, space, iris, comma, space. So this, all these commas and spaces actually need to be shifted to the left one, which is why I actually do that right here, shifting it to the left one preemptively. Because, you know, inside of this while loop, we already know that we don't go into this while loop when there's two or more words. If there's, or sorry, we only go into this while loop when there's two or more words. When there's one, we skip over it completely. We actually saw that happen. Um, so if I type in iris color blah, rearrange the words, uh, we can Look at the value here in the text visualizer. You'll see the comma space leading before iris. And then if I continue, comma space color, comma space iris. And then if I continue again, this is getting a little bit ahead of where I was explaining in the loop, but blah, comma space color, comma space iris is the final result. So that's why I actually put the comma space ahead of time so that I can properly format this last word right here. Okay, so I have shown off line 49. Uh, the next thing I do is I update the index. So I actually find the next space in the 
uh, in the string. If it was uh, iris space color space blah, what I've already done here is I've chopped off the first iris space. So now I need to go to the next index. You know, I need to update that index. I need to find what the index value is between color and blah. And that would actually be one, two, three, four, five, six. It would be index six is the next one. Uh, before it was index uh, index four. Um, if I did, if I kept it at index four, then it would chop my last name in half, which we don't want. So we have to update it. It would become index six, and that would separate color and blah. The other thing that we have to, or the other reason why we're updating the index here is in the case of when we have chopped off the second to last letter and we are left with the last, sorry, not letter, the second to last word and we are left with the last word. At that point, once we, we need to update the index so that we actually get out of this while loop right here. If we didn't do that, uh, we, we wouldn't have an infinite loop. We actually get really lucky with that. We would instead uh, eventually end up with some kind of argument out of bounds exception. So that's good. So yeah, we update int index and we go back up to the top of the while loop and we go again and again and again and again. Uh, once we only have one word left in the string, that means that there's no more spaces left in the string because of trim meaning that there's nothing at the end, and because of the way that we um, uh, defined this string words substring right here. When we updated what string words was, we chopped off the string, be or sorry, the space between the prefix, the first word, and everything else. So we chopped off that space, meaning that there's a new space that we have to find, and et cetera, et cetera. But when there's only one word left, we chopped off the space that would have been at the beginning, and there could not be any spaces at the end because of trim. And if you even really wanted to be sure, you could put dot trim at the end, but uh, with some good math, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Actually putting dot trim here would prevent the uh, multiple spaces error if someone put two spaces between the two words instead of one space, actually. So we should do that. So we'll trim it. We'll take this substring and we'll trim it just in case. Uh, let's see. Avoid two, two plus, or let's see, greater than two space problem. There we go. So yeah, we trim it. Uh, and then we know for sure that the next, you know, there, there are no spaces at the beginning or the end, and there's no spaces in the middle of the word because this is the last word. So this index becomes negative one, we break out of the loop, and we come down here. String word still has exactly one word in it, so it acts exactly the same way as it did when we only typed in one word. We take whatever was on the, like whatever was already in the label, which in this case now is a whole bunch of words separated by a comma and a space, but it begins with a comma and a space by construction, by the way that we have constructed this. It um, takes everything over here and sticks it to the end of our final word and puts all of that into the label text. And then we're solid. And if you're interested more in why, you know, my reasoning behind why all of this works, I have a miniature proof of the program right here. But we run it. Blah one, blah two blah three, blah four, blah five, you can rearrange the words, and it doesn't matter how many there are, as long as there's at least one, it works beautifully. And I can even put two spaces in between, and it still works perfectly because of that trim up there. So it works great. Now I promised how to show off how to make it accept at least two words, so that it gives an error when there's uh, only one word. Uh, what we can do is modify our if statement a bit. Um, now, if I move index of up here, it 
And the only reason why I'm doing this rather than doing it directly in the um, in the if statement condition is because if I called it up here, like in the if condition and then called it down there, that's redundant work. I might as well just set int index, right? Uh, and most of the time it means no redundant work. And even the worst case scenario where there is not um, a valid string put in, even in the worst case scenario, I'm only doing it once anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But what I can do is above my if statement, I can, instead of, instead of just saying like searching or something, I'm actually gonna say, you know, check for the space in the word, but I'm not going to use doc contains because I'm going to reuse my work here if at least one word is present or at least two words are present. So remember, if there's only spaces, if these are only type spaces or if the type spaces before or after a single word, trim is going to take care of that. So we don't need to worry about that. Now, if there's only spaces, it's going to end up being the empty string, but the index of anything in the empty string is going to be negative one anyway. And if they end up with one word right away, then the index will still be negative one because it's not present. There's no space in a one word thing. If there was a space, then there'd be at least two words. So we should move on and not go into this if statement. So all we really need to check for is if int index is not equal to negative one. And we can change this to at least two words. Um, no input or only spaces or only one word. Here we have at least uh, two words are present. And all of these comments down here are unnecessary. But now what we can do is start it. Blah. I type in one word. Oh, it still does work, huh? My apologies. This is what happens when you code live on camera, is you make mistakes. Don't code live on camera if you can help it. See, I check for if int index is not equal to negative one, which actually means that it should filter out valid claims. Yeah, there we go. I have to enter at least two words. But I did enter at least two words. I uh, negated what my condition should be. It's I'm currently checking for if it's not equal to negative one, which is what I checked for down here. That's wrong. I need to check for if it is equal to negative one. And then I don't need an else or anything like that. I can just leave the while loop as is. Um, we just know that we'll enter in here at least once and I can even make this a post fix now where I wasn't able to before. Before, when I was only checking for if there is at least one word present, right? If it was postfix, that would not work well with um, only one word. But now I'm filtering out one word cases. And in fact, we can check that. But that means that I would be able to use post test, not postfix, I apologize, post test, which means that I would be able to guarantee that the loop runs at least one time. So now, okay, if I type in just blah, it'll say, please enter at least two words. Oh, if I, apologies, uh, if I type in blah, blah, then that works perfectly. Um, I should type in blah, blah too, so you can see the difference there. That's great. Uh, if I type in a whole bunch of spaces, it gives me an error. If I type in nothing, it gives me an error. So that works great. Here's the post uh, test version of this loop right here. It's exactly the same, except I just changed where the condition was. And you'll see that if I type in blah right here, it's caught by that if statement above, so nothing happens. And if I type in blah, comma, space, or sorry, blah, space, blah, two, it rearranges the words just fine. Um, and that reason why we can do postfix here is because of the fact that we're checking for only one word. If I 
wasn't checking for only one word if I just checked for a stir words equals empty string. If I did that, it would cause problems. If I only had one word, we get this argument out of range exception. Um, length cannot be less than zero. So that would be bad if we had it like this when there is only one word, because then um, there's only one word, it automatically goes into the loop. It tries to uh, make a substring based on negative one right here, since negative one does not show up in, um, or sorry, since the space does not show up in a string containing one word, and then you get this argument error like that. So you can do postfix like this if you eliminate the one word case because at that point you know for sure that you're going through the loop at least once since there's at least two words yeah, and you only should be in that loop if there are at least two words in string words. So yeah that is a fun example of how to work with index of and substring. All right well that is substrings. Um, a pretty important concept when it comes to actually working with strings is seeing what substrings are contained within a string.